Alright, today is Tuesday, September 27th, and this is a recap for the stock market activities today. Now, folks, I got a good one for you tonight, although it's going to be short and sweet, and the reason is I just got back from traveling. I was in Palm Desert, and now I'm back, so we're going to keep it short and sweet and cover the most immediate issues that we have in hand. But that doesn't mean that we don't have a lot of issues to talk about. We're going to talk about these issues in details in upcoming videos. Let's brush on some of them, the most important ones, at least since the last time we talked. Obviously, over the weekend, the elections in Italy, and we now know that Fratelli d'Italia won, and this is a major, major move. It's not just what we saw in Sweden, now we're seeing it in Italy, and this is going to be a contagious wave, as the population in many countries start to revolt and start to complain about the cost of living, inflation, and these sanctions that are causing more and more energy inflation in these countries. And this is the backlash. We're seeing it right now in Italy, and of course, the American media is so confused, they don't know what to make of it, because it is a warning signal for the November elections, what the outcome of that one is going to be. Take, for example, the CIA post. They say in Italy and beyond, packaging toxic populism. And then you got the Daily Beast, another government propaganda publication. They say Biden has no ambassador in Italy, as it flirts with uh, fascism. And then he got the Atlantic, which is owned by oligarch, the widower of Steve Jobs. Well, the Atlantic says Italians did not exactly vote for fascism. And then he got the New York Times, and they say Georgia Meloni is extreme, but she's no tyrant. And of course, they're confused because Georgia Meloni is not their kind of leader, you know, the WEF kind of leader. But at the same time, she's pro-NATO, she's pro-extending and escalating the war. So they're going to tolerate her for a little bit. And the same goes with the extreme right-wingers who won in Sweden. They're going to cover for them too, so long as they go with the program. Maybe not necessarily the WEF program, but the uh, war program, which is at most importance right now, at least to them. Who's them? You know who. And another important event that happened today is the blow up of Nord Stream. They say it's an act of sabotage, quote unquote. And now we're seeing massive pollution happening in the Baltic, at least according to the Danish military. And now the speculation goes, who was behind the act of sabotage? Was it Russia? Why would Russia destroy the pipelines that pretty much were intended to secure their economic future with Germany? Was it the United States? Some are speculating that that is the case. Today we heard from the former Polish defense minister who said that the U.S. blew up the Russian gas pipelines Nord Stream 1 and 2. This is a major escalation and the economic consequences a dire. Even though for now, technically speaking, there is not a lot of gas flowing from Nord Stream to where Germany right now. But if the pipelines are blown, then we know for sure that Germany is cut off. And this spells doom and gloom. A disaster for Germany. Because even if the war de-escalates for some reason, you're not going to have the Russians pumping gas all the way back to Germany again. The pipelines are destroyed now. So what is the alternative? Who wins from all of this? The answer is LNG, liquid natural gas, specifically American liquid natural gas producers. And today we saw a mini pop in natural gas futures here in the United States. We also have an important event, perhaps more important than the latter two, which is the crash of the British pound. Now, what the British government led by Liz Tuss did is absolute lunacy. It is a recipe for disaster for the United Kingdom. You have insane record inflation and on top of that you pour gasoline on the fire by issuing more stimulus and more tax cuts this is absolute lunacy and this will push the bank of england to be even more aggressive in their tightening policy to shore up the british pound and now we have this tit for tat between the UK government and the Bank of England. And this will guarantee that the United Kingdom will fall into a massive deep recession. On top of that, it's not just the Bank of England or the Bank of Japan or the ECB. We have the currency wars heating up significantly as we speak right now. Central banks are now pinned against each other. You see the Fed tightening and that pushes the value of the US dollar higher. Now, this is not good for US-based companies, but it is good for US inflation. It pushes US inflation down. On the other hand, it pushes currencies such as the British pound, the euro, the yen, and many others down significantly. And that pushes inflation in those countries higher. And in response, their central banks have to increase the rates higher to shore up the currency, whatever it is. The British pound, the euro, the yen, and then as a response, the dollar goes down and inflation rises higher here and the Fed has to act more aggressively. We have a massive race to the bottom among central banks. 
And this is the most dangerous episode in this bear market by far because something is gonna blow up here. If the US dollar continues on its meteoric rise, something is gonna blow up overseas. And that something could be really big and it could be contagious to the global economy. You see, now we're entering the systemic risk episode of this bear market. And it is by far the most dangerous episode. Back in 2008, we got the systemic risk episode at around October, November of 2008, the collapse of Lehman. And you probably remember the aftermath of this event in terms of the global economy and financial markets. My hunch is we're getting closer and closer here to something blowing up and ushering the systemic risk episode in the global market. Now, all of this talk is fundamental in nature, but these fundamentals could impact two other factors that move markets. Remember, markets move based on three things. Number one, the fundamentals. Number two, the technicals. Number three, the mechanics. But the fundamentals could cause a mechanical event, such as margin calls, and things could blow up. But for now, in the immediate horizon, what do we have in charge here? Are the fundamentals in charge? They are in the long run, and they've been so far this year. But right now, this moment, this week, is it the fundamentals? The answer is not really. Is it the mechanics? Not really. We don't have an options-related event this week. But we are in a pivotal technical point here. I talked a little bit about it on Sunday's video, The Last Battle, Apple 150 and the importance of that level. We're going to talk about that again in this video, but the importance comes with the retest of the June bottom. It is a psychological battle between bulls and bears. Are the bulls about to grab the steering wheel and produce yet another bear market rally? Or is there going to be a failure at the June bottom? And we see the bears getting the all clear signal to short and double down in the event of the failure of the June bottom, and this could unleash a massive wave of selling known as the epic finale, the crash leg, and therefore the technicals right now are extremely important, along with the psychology. So let's talk about it, and here it is, in focus tonight. The epic finale comes down to this, the June bottom and Apple 150. If they fail, the sinkhole will open, and here comes the epic finale. But if they hold, we have an epic bear market rally coming. Now, we don't want to miss an either event if it happens, and therefore we have to look at certain indicators, technical and psychological, because this is the scope of this discussion in this video. We'll talk about the fundamentals and the mechanics in another video. But in this video, let's look at different indicators and see what they say. What is the position of the bulls on these indicators? What is the position of the bears on these same indicators? Let's start with the sentiment indicators, the psychology right now. It is not a surprise to anyone that the market is in bearish sentiment right now, and perhaps some would argue it is is extreme bearish sentiment and that gives us a chance to buy. And the argument goes as, think of it as a contrarian indicator. For example, when we look at the American Association of Individual Investors Sentiment Index, the reading is the most bearish since March 2009. And the bulls would argue, hey look, when the sentiment got really extreme back in March 2009, that was actually the bottom. So that means that we're getting really close to the bottom once again. Here's the problem. The bottom happened in March 2009 because the Fed initiated a change in the monetary policy to become extremely accommodative, quote-unquote. We don't see any pivot right now, with inflation sky high. And of course, this is the counter from the bears. And I say, I would not pay attention to these sentiment indicators right now. And the reason is, and this is from July 19th, according to the Bank of America Money Manager Survey, the sentiment indicator became extremely bearish, to even exceed the extreme bearish sentiment back in October 2008. A lot of folks argued that this is a capitulation sort of deal, this is extreme pessimism, and it should produce a bottom. And guess what? We got a bear market rally. But that did not last, and the market made a U-turn back to the June bottom once again. And here's an important take from Jim Bianco. Everybody has to pay attention to this because you see these sentiment indicators being floated around. Oh, this means buy, this means a bottom is near, this means a rebound is near, yada, yada, yada. But listen to this. Be careful of statements about too much bearishness, quote unquote. Such statements have been made since August and have been disastrous. Eventually, the market will bottom, but maybe tomorrow or next year, and some stopped clock will proclaim they saw it. 
because everyone was too bearish. However, bear market sentiment can go to apocalyptic slash suicidal levels. No bearishness is too extreme. Bull market sentiment can go to euphoric slash mania levels. No bullishness is too extreme. You may know this as FOMO or TINA. Bear market sentiment is the inverse of a bull market, meaning when they say, oh, this is too bearish, that doesn't mean shit because you got QT. You got inverse TINA. And until you have a change in this dynamic, this this is not a buying opportunity. Instead, this is yet another chance to get slaughtered once again. Likewise, we will look at oversold. You hear that a lot. Oversold. It means the bottom is here or a rebound is coming. But there is a catch and it is an important one. Look for example at the RSI for the S&P 500. The reading is technically oversold. We have seen at least two major rebounds this year from such oversold quote unquote levels on the RSI. But here's the catch. The reading on the RSI could get even more extremely oversold. But in such case, when you have extreme oversold quote unquote readings already on the RSI. Diving into more extreme readings means that this is a crash. And this is exactly what we saw back in 2020 during the crash of the thing. In response to that, the RSI dived down in a crash toward the extremely negative readings. And this could happen again in a crash scenario. In other words, the bet right now looking at the RSI on the S&P 500 is it should rebound. But if it doesn't rebound, and we see another flush down, it will happen because the market is crashing. AKA, this is the epic finale that Jeremy Grantham was talking about. The massive leg to the downside, just like we've seen back in 2009 and back in 2000. In 2020, in the fourth quarter of 2018, a crash of 20% in a short amount of time. And remember what I say frequently in this program. Our job is not to predict the future. Nobody can do that. Our job is to pick the pieces of the puzzle, put them together, and make an assumption of where we're heading. And you make an educated guess when it comes to your trading based on that analysis. So when we talk about the RSI, if it doesn't hold, if we don't get the rebound, this will only happen if we have a crash leg underway. What is the most important level right now, technically speaking, preventing the crash leg from happening? The answer is the June bottom. There are still hopes in the market that the June bottom will produce a double bottom phenomenon and this will be the bottom. And until that sentiment is defeated, we're not going to see the loss of the June bottom. So we know that we have an important level to watch. We also have an important level, which is Apple 150, which comes hand in hand with the S&P 500 June bottom, which is being tested right now as we speak. So as a trader, you know a major move is coming. You're watching the RSI, and now you're watching these important levels that we're talking about. And if the charts crack below these levels and they close below them, then you know which way you're going to bet on. And you'll know that right away because we have signs that one of these two outcomes has a better chance of happening. We'll talk about that in a second. But look at the drawdowns, for example, for the SPX, the cash index of the S&P 500. It is an extreme reading. It is the same reading from which we got a bear market rally, a major one, back in June. When the bulls look at this they say look we got a bounce from this before we're gonna get a bounce from the same level again this will be the double bottom and higher we go but the bears will look at this and say you had your chance to rebound before from these extreme readings and you failed that means the market wants to go down further and the drawdowns could become even more extreme but we'll only know that once the june bottom is defeated once and for all once the bulls say yeah this is too dangerous i'm not gonna do it i'm not buying the dip here that is the moment when the bears say okay if you're not going to do anything about it, then we're going to double down and bet for more downside to come. And here comes a massive leg to the downside. On top of that, look at the VIX curve, for example. The bears would look at this and argue, yes, the bulls are saying the sentiment indicators are getting too extreme. They would say that the market is oversold. We have all the conditions here to make a fire. And this fire is to the upside, a rebound. We can call it a bear market rally all we want, but do you really want to miss it? Do you really want to stand on its way? You don't want to do that. No smart trader would do that. So the bears need more arguments. They need more technical indicators to solidify their case that all of these oversold readings, all of these extreme bearish readings could get even more extreme. And this is one of the indicators the bears can use. And this indicator is the inversion of the VIX curve. In other words, we're just starting to see the inversion happening. So when you hear the bulls saying, hey, the readings are too extreme, we're due for a rebound, you look at this indicator and the bears would say not so fast. 
we're just starting here. We could see more of this coming, more inversion in the VIX curve happening, and more and more downside in the stock market. And if this June bottom cracks, where do we go from here? The answer is, if this double bottom doesn't hold, then we go back to the previous double bottom, which happened around November of 2020. We're going to erase an entire year worth of gains in the stock market. So many stocks already erased the entire gains from the pandemic era. Some stocks are even trading below their 2019 levels before the crash. So we're watching the June bottom and we're also watching perhaps a more important level here which is Apple 150. Apple is the market and the market is Apple. You're not going to see the epic finale leg, the crash, without two names crashing. Apple and Tesla. But most importantly, Apple. If Apple crashes, no way Tesla will hold on its own. And now we're looking at 150. And as you can see, the algos, the plunge protection team, the whoever, they know that this is an important level to keep. Because if this level fails, Apple will crash and along with it the stock market. Why would Apple crash if it loses 150 for good? There are many mechanical reasons behind that. Options positioning is one, but most importantly, Apple remains the ad performer. The S&P is down big. A lot of the big caps are down big. The Nasdaq is down big. But there is this belief among market participants that Apple is a safe stock. For one thing, it is ad performing. For another, the company is flush with cash. You always got to put in place by the buybacks. But once that sentiment is shaken out, once Apple loses 150 and Apple holders and other market participants watch the action and say, oh, wait a minute here. Maybe after all, Apple is not immune to the change in the economic cycle from boom to bust. But forget about the fundamentals, the technicals, which is the scope of this video. 150 is an important psychological level. We talked about it in Sunday's video. So if it is lost for good, Along with the June bottom, the bears will double down and we will see the epic finale leg. And there is no stopping it at that point. I mean, think about it. If the market crashes right now from this point and goes down 15-20% to the downside, with the Fed pivot right away, that will be damaging to their credibility, specifically if inflation continues to linger higher. And therefore, I say this is a pivotal point of the market. I have my bets in case we have a rebound rally. And I discussed that with the members on Sunday's video, buying a weekly call spread on Apple. I did that on Friday, closed them on Monday morning. And by Monday afternoon, before the close, I did buy them again and then flipped them in the morning for another profit. In two days, the trade produced over 40% worth of profits. But I'm also prepared if it doesn't hold. And when you look at Apple right now, this is a 15 minutes chart, 150. You can see that the rescue operation happened over and over and over again to keep Apple above 150. But it already lost that level twice. I think that the third time is the charm. And if Apple loses 150 once again, it's over. They're not going to be able to profit higher again. And therefore, I'm also positioned with options and otherwise, if the bearish scenario happens and we see a massive leg down coming. So the message here, folks, is be ready for either scenario. You now know which levels to watch for. Number one, the June bottom. Number two, Apple 150. And here's number three, the 200 weeks moving average. If all three are defeated, then in effect, the bulls lose their last line of defense. They got nothing here. But so long as these three are intact, the bulls still have hope. And the bears must remain vigilant and careful not to be caught in an epic bear market rally. And they must instead look at these three levels and watch how they hold. If they start to break one by one, then you know what's coming. And you're going to position yourself exactly the way you should be. And make a lot of profit in the way. I'm going to add to this discussion once again in the charts analysis. But before we move on, two important videos videos you need to watch. Video number one, we made it a few weeks ago, the epic finale leg, the call by Jeremy Grantham, and I explained that to you in details, what the epic finale leg means. Video number two, about four months ago, we talked about, is this the initial shock, or is this the crash? the stock market crash. And in that video, I took you back to 2008 and I argued that what we saw back then in the summer of 2022 is almost identical to what we saw back in the summer of 2008. And then after that, what happened? The crash at around October, November 2008. And it did not stop all the way till March of 2009. And in that video, I told you that this is not the crash. This is the leg before the crash, we're going to have another bear market rally. But then after that, we're going to have the epic finale and the crash leg. We'll see what happens, but watching these two videos will give you a lot of clarity on what I'm talking about right now. In the meantime, I have to move on and cover the stock market information for you. And let's start with the closing of the indices today. And here we go. The Dow Industrial Average in the red down by 125.82 points or a decline of 0.43%. The Nasdaq in the green by 26.58 points or a gain 
for quarter of a percent. The S&P 500 down by 7.75 points or a decline of 0.21%. Moving on to the sector's performances today. Leading the pack at number 1, capturing the gold medal, energy. Number 2 for the silver, materials. Number 3 for the bronze, technology. An interesting, weird mix, but the message is, the market is still hoping that the June bottom is going to hold. And the thesis here is, the dollar is going to top at some point, And therefore, they're going to buy energy, they're going to buy materials, and they bought technology. And you could see that the theme was bullish in nature today, even though some of the indices closed in the red or flattish. But you can see it from the laggards. The laggards today were were led by utilities, defensives, and real estate. As if the market is saying, we're starting to believe the June bottom theory. Let's go with the offensive sectors of the market, energy, materials, and technology, and let's dump the so-called safety of utilities, defensive, and REITs. What about the advance to decline ratios? NYSE, 48% advancing versus 49% declining. The NASDAQ, 52% advancing versus 44% declining. Commodities, what's going on here? This is how we close. A decent day for energy energy commodities, but muted otherwise. And I want you to look at the contrast between the US dollar versus the British pound. By the end of the action, the British pound was slightly higher, and so was the dollar. But earlier in the morning, the British pound was rebounding a lot higher and the dollar was actually trading in the red and that decline in the dollar had an impact a positive one commodities take a look here it is you see the difference when the dollar is down the pound is up we see a major rally in commodities but the moment the dollar surged higher again and the british pound gave up most of the gains a lot of commodities also gave up a lot of the gains. What is the message here? The message is, for those bulls who hope that we could see a bottom or a rebound because the dollar is about to top and maybe reverse course, be careful what you wish for. Because the moment the dollar goes down, we're going to see an insane rally in commodities. And this will push inflation higher. What happens when inflation rises higher or continues to stick? The Fed has to be more aggressive. On the other hand, if the dollar continues to rise higher, with the British pound, the Japanese yen, the euro, Euro, the Kiwi, they're all going to get crushed. And this will push inflation in those countries higher. You see the challenge, you see the dilemma that we're in right now. It is absolutely insane. But regardless, it was a good day for energy commodities. Both the WTI and Brent were up by almost 2.5% apiece. The gasoline RBOB with a major rebound of about 4.5%. Heating oil also rebounded by about 4%. On the other hand, natural gas by the end of the day gave up the majority of the gains from the morning and then some. We will see a lot of volatility here in natural gas after the Nord Stream news. When it comes to softs, muted action across the board with exception of gainers led by Number one, lumber with gains of over 5%. Number two, OJ with gains of almost two and three quarters of a percent. And then we have cocoa with gains of about one and a half percent. When it comes to metals, muted action across the board, but we have a noticeable decline for silver down about three quarters of a percent. And then we have a noticeable gain for palladium worth about 1%. Meats down across the board led by lean hogs, feeder cattle, live cattle all down. Likewise for grains, muted action mostly to the downside. Soybeans and oats are down almost 1% apiece. On the other hand, we have a noticeable gain for wheat futures up about 1.5%. What is the message here, folks? Yes, commodities are going down, hence the prospects of future inflation are going down, but are they going down enough? Because if they're not, and they keep popping higher in these massive rebound rallies, then we have sticky inflation. Combine that with a deteriorating economy that some would argue it is collapsing. This is a lethal combination here, folks. Weakening economy and an aggressive Fed. But does the Fed have any other choice? The answer is not really. Moving on to the options market, the big casino, what's going on here? The put-to-call ratio is improving toward the bear side, not the bull side, because we're seeing more buying of puts, more confidence, more conviction in buying puts. The volume is subdued all in all. Nevertheless, number one, the hottest table by far, is Tesla, the souffle. At around 1.7 million contracts traded today, about 52.5% of those were calls. At number two, Apple, with around 1.3 million contracts traded today, about 53% of those were puts. This is how you know you're in a bear market, not a bull market. People are buying more puts than calls on Apple, the almighty Apple, which in a bull market, we would have said this is lunacy, this is insane. Sanity. It's a sin to bet against Apple. It's blasphemy. Yada, yada, yada. Now it's just the norm. It's actually one of the best short ideas left in the market right now. At number three, Amazon with around 600,000 contracts traded today. About 58% of those were calls. 
On to the unusual activities that took place in the options market today. We start with the talk of the town. Everybody noticed this. The ticker LQD. This is the ETF for corporate grade bonds. These are the good ones. These are the Glengarry leads. And now they're crashing. And the yields are now surging higher on these. What does that mean? The risk is also moving higher. That something is going to blow up. Even in these corporate grade bonds and somebody's betting for more pain to come they bought the 80 bucks put for the expiration date december 16 with expectations that the name could move down and lose more than 21 percent of its value by then they paid around 20 cents a piece to enter this trade all in all spending around four and a half million dollars and then we have the hyg this is the etf for the junk bonds the yields are already exploding you know this means credit risk you know this means bankruptcies and explosions all over the place in these junk bonds their holders and issuers and now somebody's betting for more pain to come the hyg they bought the 64 put for the expiration date december 16th with expectations the hyg could move down and lose more than 10 percent of its value by then they paid around 80 cents a piece to enter this trade all in all spending around one million dollars at the bottom of the table what about the ticker xlu the etf for utilities we used to think about it as safety well perhaps not anymore because somebody bought the 64 puts for the expiration date october 21st with expectations that the name could move down and lose more than seven percent of its value by then they paid around 60 cents a piece to enter this trade all in all spending around six hundred thousand dollars continuing with interesting trades what about the ticker xle energy they say energy is the last remaining bull market well maybe that's gonna crash too because somebody's buying more puts in the xle they bought the 58 puts for the expiration date november 18th with expectations the xle could lose more than 16 and a half percent of its value by then they paid around one buck and 20 cents a piece to enter this trade all in all spending around 1.2 million dollars and then what about the ticker ibb this is the biotechnology etf and somebody's betting for more pain to come they bought the 109 puts for the expiration date december 16th with expectations that the name could move down and lose more than five percent of its value by then they paid around four and a half bucks a piece to enter this trade all in all spending around three million dollars and lastly what about the ticker tsla tesla the souffle it's not cracking yet but it's just a matter of time and somebody's betting on that exactly and they bought the 245 puts for the expiration date november 18th with expectations that tesla could move down and lose more than 13 and a half percent of its value by then and they paid around 12 and a half bucks a piece to enter this trade all in all spending around seven and a half million dollars moving on to the heat map analysis what's going on here we talked a lot about the theme in the market performance segment we covered the sector's performances but the theme is clear here we talked about the bull versus the bear debate the bulls say the june bottom will hold this is going to be a beginning of a bottom or at least an epic bear market rally the bears say no no chance the june bottom will not hold apple 150 will not hold and we will see another massive leg to the downside and this is all reflected right in front of you looking at the heat map you see the defensives are being sold finally the bears are saying even the defensives are not going to hold they're dumping utilities they're dumping REITs, they're dumping defensives they're dumping healthcare too they're dumping financials on the other hand you still see some bulls fighting back suggesting that this could be the beginning of a rebound rally and that is reflected in the travel and leisure the so-called reopening names we're still waiting on the reopening right you see it in tesla up about two and a half percent today you see it in software a lot of these names went higher today you saw it in chips you see it in apple today even the energy bulls are fighting back saying hold on here commodities have another leg higher before they say goodbye and you see it reflected in materials the agricultural names the fertilizer names steel copper all in the green today it is a battlefield it is a debate going on right now between the bulls and the bears fortunately for us we don't have to wait too long to find out who's going to win so let's move on to the heat map for the etfs again muted action negative for the defensives be it reits the iyr be it consumer staples the xlp be it utilities the xlu but some optimism here in the xop energy xle in retail the reopening names the xrt in technology specifically chips the S MH was up today, the SOXX was up today, and we also see some of that optimism in the materials ETF, the XME, which was up by almost 3% today. But besides that, we also see the pessimism, the bear side of the argument. The VIX proxies are up, the UVXY up about 2%. We see bond 
ETFs down big, be it the TLT, be it the EMB. We see corporate bonds down big, the LQD down 1.5% today. That is a big move for an ETF that is supposed to be stable. But for now, let's move on to charts and we start with SPY, the S&P 500. 30 minutes chart what's going on here well unlike friday we now have a legitimate retest of the so-called june bottom which stands at around 362.16 the chart closed above the june bottom after retesting not by a lot so we're now waiting and waiting what the outcome is gonna be we could see the move happening in the futures overnight by the time you get this video we could see it in the morning we could see it by the close tomorrow but we're getting really really close and all clear that this is a beginning of a rebound rally would be the SPY reclaiming 385 so we're asking the SPY to close the gap at around 373 and a half and we're asking the SPY to get us all the way above 385 to say okay now we have enough evidence that we're not going to crack through the June bottom at least not right now and we have another extension another bear market rally but if the June bottom doesn't hold then we have an epic crash leg coming and we talked about targets on Sunday's video. Here's the daily chart for the continuous contract for the SPY, the S&P 500. Again, the chart is retesting the June bottom as I speak right now. The volume is moving higher on down days. This is not a good sign for the bulls, good sign for the bears. But the bulls once again have the argument that look at the momentum indicators. Look at the RSI, for example. It is becoming really, really oversold. Where at the June bottom, you put two and two together, the risk versus reward says we should rebound, at least a rebound rally, a bear market rally. Here's the problem with this argument. When we switch to a weekly chart for the SPX, the cash index, S&P 500 still, the prospects of a reverse head and shoulder is gone now and the bulls are hoping for a double bottom rebound. Yet the RSI indicator, the MACD indicator, aka the momentum indicators, on the weekly chart, they're not really oversold. They have plenty of room to the downside to go. And if they do, we can go all the way down to revisit an important trend line as you can see in yellow and it would not be unreasonable to say you could hear S&P 500 3000 once again. Here's the Q's 30 minutes chart. What's going on here? We got yet another pop higher in the morning, but there was a failure in the retest of 280 as resistance. It was a failure to close the gap and therefore the chart went all the way down and it closed at the lows of the day. Now, unlike the SPY, the Q's has yet to retest the June bottom, which sets at around 269.29. The question here is, could we see the June bottom failing to hold in the SPY, but it does hold in the Q's? These are possibilities. But if the S&P loses the June bottom, if the Russell 2000 also loses the June bottom, and most importantly, if Apple loses 150, you bet the Q's, the Nasdaq, will lose the June bottom. Now, since this show is coming out too late, in the evening, you've already heard a lot of technical analysts on YouTube and otherwise who will play with such formation and they will say, hey look, this appears to be a double top here, it means the queues will go down tomorrow. Oh hey look, this is a bear flag pattern, it means the queues will go down tomorrow. Or, hey look, this is a double bottom or a saucer bottoming formation and the queues will go higher tomorrow. This is all voodoo science. Does it mean anything at all? What is the psychology saying right now? This is a more important question to ask rather than dwelling on these candlestick patterns, double bottoms, double tops, bear flags, bull flags. The technicals are important. But what is the psychology saying right now? The psychology says, looking at the chart, the bulls made two attempts at it to crack above 280 and they failed in both attempts. Can can we see attempt number three? The answer is probably. But again, after being defeated twice, what does the psychology say among the bulls? The answer is they're getting a little nervous. They're getting a little doubtful that maybe the June bottom is not going to hold. On the other hand, the bears are out of the way, at least for now. And they're saying, hey, bulls, show us what you got. Because if you're going to bounce from this point on, there's no point for me to short again. There's no point for me to double down. So you go first. Show us what you got. And the bulls failed twice at showing us what they got. What if they capitulate tomorrow? What if they say, eh, it's not going to happen. Have at it, bears. It's yours now. The buyers capitulate. The buyers are nowhere to be found. Well, the sellers are going to show up. Be it holders, dumping, or be it bears and shorts doubling down. Here's the daily chart for the continuous contract for the NASDAQ. Again, we're not exactly at the June bottom, which is at around 11,058.5. The volume is still above average. 
mostly for down days. The momentum indicators are still negative, be it, of course, here it is again, the RSI at least getting a little oversold. The problem is, it's not oversold in the weekly, certainly not oversold in the monthly. And here's the IWM 30 minutes chart. What's going on here? 164.91 is a pivotal support slash resistance. And now the chart is playing back and forth at around that level. It was oversold in the beginning of the week, and it is playing out these oversold conditions by consolidating. Now, the bullish scenario in this case would have been a massive rebound higher, be it a gap up, be it a gradual build up higher. That would be bullish because hey, the chart got really oversold, the buyers are showing up, and they got the chart higher. This is not the case. This is the chart consolidating to work out these oversold conditions, at least in the 30 minutes chart, which means the chart is flirting with moving down after working out these oversold conditions. You see, when you have a bull market, like we have in the dollar right now, for example, Look at the RSI and the dollar, it's insane. But if the dollar continues to move higher and then it consolidates to work out these overbought conditions, once that's resolved, the dollar moves higher again. When you have oversold conditions, the opposite is true. If the chart works out the oversold conditions by consolidating, as we're seeing right now in the indices, that is actually bearish. It means we're going down. But in this chart, in the dollar, the RSI is, well, overbought, so is the MACD, but the chart continues to move higher and higher and higher. Over the weekend we talked about resistance at 120 don't be surprised if you're bidding against the dollar if you're saying hey i should buy commodities right now or I should buy technology because the dollar is way overbought don't be surprised to continue to eat pies day after day after day we're not going to say the dollar is done here until it's done until the dollar says i'm done folks this is it this is all i got oh, we're now eyeing 120 or if we see a clear reversal and a clear reversal would be from a technical standpoint, number one, a candlestick pattern indicating a reversal, but not only that, a confirmation after that, on top of the RSI, the MACD indicators crashing, and we don't see the dollar consolidating, we see it crashing, going down big after it places a reversal candle. We also need to combine it with the fundamentals. Which fundamental factor pushed the dollar down? And is it sustainable or not? Only if that happens, we can bet against the dollar and say, okay, we're out of the woods in the equities market and in commodities. But for now, we're not. And of course, there is the catch. The dollar goes down, inflation goes higher, the Fed has to tighten more. Either way, the bulls lose. In the meantime, what's going on with gold here? Gold continues to crash. The bear flag is playing out. And now we have the next support at around 1600 can gold crash all the way down there? We see the dollar popping higher to 120. The dollar stops on a double top. Gold rebounds. I'm just trying to read the tea leaves here. But we're not there yet. Until we get there, a lot of pain will happen. So don't stand in the way of the dollar moving higher. Another one is Brent Oil, a daily chart. What's going on here? The bulls still have some hope here, so long as 85 is intact to support. But it looks that the chart gave ample opportunity for the bulls to show up, and they did not. So are they thinking right now that 85 is better than 90? They've been waiting till 85 to start buying? I say not really. I say if the buyers don't show up, the sellers will. And so far this week, we've seen the chart cracking below 85 twice before moving higher again. Are you seeing the parallels here? Apple retesting or cracking below 150 twice and then rescued higher again. Brent oil cracking below 85 twice before being rescued higher again. The Nasdaq retesting resistance twice and failing. Third time is a charm, folks. Anyways, here's the 10-year yield. It is blasting higher. Again, we can talk about overboard in the RSI all we want, but we have massive fundamental drivers here. Among them, the Fed is dumping bonds. Central banks across the world are dumping bonds to shore up their currencies. We're talking about U.S. bonds, and this is going to contribute to the 10-year moving higher and higher and higher. Most importantly, the two-year. The two-year now put a consolidation candlestick, at least for today. We know it is quote-unquote overbought, but it could get overbought even more because it's not that overbought from a weekly and monthly perspectives. So for the bulls watching right now, you got to see the June bottom holding. You got to see Apple 150 holding. You got to see the dollar going down. You got to see yields going down. You got to see the VIX reversing before you have the all clear that this is at least a bear market rally. For now, do we have any reversal in the two year? Of course not. What about the TLT, a weekly chart? What's going on here? The RSI is getting, once again, oversold. 
But does that mean anything at all? The answer is maybe not really. Not when you're crashing because it can get oversold even more. You look at the MACD indicator, we have a confirmation now that 109 and a half is not going to happen. And the next stop would be if 100 doesn't hold, the next stop would be 90. We're seeing a crash in the bond market. The TLT in the bond market has been a leading indicator to what's about to happen in the equities market. And now the TLT says, we're not going to see a bear market rally. We will see the crash instead. So we'll put that in the bears camp, the TLT. What about the VIX? Four hours chart. What's going on here? It stopped at the resistance at 33. But look at the MACD. It is still in positive momentum. It can go higher. We talked about the three stages of the VIX, the crash, the consolidation, and the pop. Are we seeing the pop happening right now? Here's the weekly chart for the VIX. Look at the momentum. It is surging. It is firming up, indicating that we could see a massive pop in the VIX. We talked over the weekend about Katie Stockton. She sees the VIX popping above 40, maybe to the 60s, before we see that epic finale leg done. And here's Apple, a daily chart, a nice bounce once again from 150. Yet again, the volume, the momentum indicators remain negative, at least for now. The bulls have to catch 157 as support before we say okay 150 was good support or maybe a rescue operation doesn't matter to me the end result is the same it will get us above 157 the epic finale is delayed and now we have a bear market rally yet a daily closing below 150 you know what's going to happen the sellers are going to show up the selling is going to accelerate it's going to get us all the way down to 145, 138. And you might see the chart cutting through these support lines like knife through butter. Tesla, an hourly chart. What's going on here? The good news is it is outperforming. It is above 280, a critical important support slash resistance. The bad news. Number one, it did not make it above closing the gap at around 288.49. Number two, it is working oversold conditions on the RSI via consolidation. A little bit of a move higher, but still within a range. What does that mean? Once these oversold conditions are resolved, down we go. Why do we say that? Look at the daily chart for Tesla. We talked about this in details on Sunday's video. But here's the daily chart. Let's say the most important support is 280. Why do we say that? Because without 280, you don't have the reverse head and shoulder formation. And you actually have the triple top, which means Tesla goes down to retest the lows at around 215, 210. Can we see a rescue operation? Sure. But the bulls have to recapture 280 by the end of the week and close above this number by the end of the week. And here it is, tulips, Bitcoin, four hours chart. What's going on here? Bitcoin was under consolidation in a range for a little while and that energy popped to the upside. However, the reversal came right away and it could not make it above 20,000. Looking at the action right now, what does that say? Bitcoin doesn't have the energy to crack above 20,000, at least the way I see it right now, based on the action that I have right now. Well, if the buyers are not here to get us above 20,000, guess what's going to happen? The sellers are going to show up and they're going to crack this support once and for all. We see Bitcoin crashing to 15,000, even 10,000. And therefore, folks, we say we are in a critical period in the stock market right now. A major move coming. And now you know what to look for. So let's move on to the conclusion of this video. What do we have on the economic calendar tomorrow? Well, we have a bunch of Fed zombies speaking once again. Most importantly, the big dog, Jerome Powell. We'll see what he says. Lots of criticism from Jeremy Siegel and the likes that the Fed is overdoing it. And the question is, will Jerome Powell's knees buckle to the pressure? Will he say, okay, maybe we're overdoing it here. I hear you. Let's do 50 basis points next time. And then 25 and then wrap it up. Or is he going to double down and say, I don't give a flying f what Jeremy Siegel says. I'm going to crush this inflation and do whatever it takes to crush this inflation, even if it means a recession and a stock market crash. We also have pending home sales. But besides that, this is all I got for you for now. Once again, folks, thank you for listening. Thank you for watching. I will talk to you again tomorrow. Do you wonder ever you're a bad man? No, I don't wonder, Marty. The world needs bad men.